There will be lots of chances later on this year to look at the PlayStation 5 games. Today, I want to talk a bit about our goals for the PlayStation 5 hardware and how they influenced the development of the console. I think you all know I'm a big believer in console generations. Once every five or six or seven years, a console arrives with substantially new capabilities. There's a lot of learning by the game developers, hopefully not too overwhelming, and soon there's games that could never have been created before. Now, it used to be that as a console designer, you'd somehow intuit what would be the best set of capabilities for the new console, and then build it in complete secrecy. For the PlayStation consoles, that period lasted through PlayStation 3, a powerful and groundbreaking console, but also one that caused quite a lot of heartache, as it was initially difficult to develop games for. So, starting with PlayStation 4, we've taken a different approach, roughly centered around three principles. The first of these is listening to the developers, which is to say that a lot of what we put into a console derives directly from the needs and aspirations of the game creators. We definitely do have some ideas of our own, but at the core of our philosophy for designing consoles is that game players are here for the fantastic games. Which is to say that game creators matter. Anything we can do to make life easier for the game creators or help them realize their dreams, we will do. So about once every two years, I take a tour of the industry. I go to the various developers and publishers, sit down, and discuss how they're doing with the current consoles and what they'd like to see in future consoles. This requires weeks on the road, as reaching the bulk of the game creators involves talking to well over 100 people at something like two dozen publishers and developers. And it is incredibly valuable. By the way, the feature most requested by the developers, that was an SSD which we were very happy to put in the hardware, but a lot of problem solving was required. I'll be doing a deep dive on the SSD and surrounding systems later on in this talk. It's also key to make a generational leap while keeping the console sufficiently familiar to game developers. I think about this in terms of balancing evolution and revolution. Now, with PlayStation 1, 2, and 3, the target was a revolution each time with a brand new feature set. That was great in many ways, but time for the developers to get up and running got longer with each console. In the past, I've called this time to triangle. Here's what I had for those three consoles. To be clear, I'm not talking about time to make a game. Developers will be ambitious, and it may take them six years or so to realize their vision. What I'm talking about is that dead time before graphics and other aspects of game development are up and running, and trying to minimize that. On the other hand, if we're trying to reduce that dead time to zero, that means the hardware architecture can't change at all. We're handcuffed. We need to judge for each feature what value it adds and whether it's worth the increase in developer time needed to support it. So with PlayStation 4, we were able to strike a pretty good balance between performance and familiarity. We got required learning back to PlayStation 1 levels. With PS5, the GPU was definitely the area we felt the most tension between adding new features and keeping a familiar programming model. Ultimately, I think we've ended up with something under a month of getting up to speed. That feels like we're striking about the right balance. I'll go into a bit more detail later today about our philosophy with the GPU and the specific feature set that resulted from it. It's also very important for us, as the hardware team, to find new dreams, by which I mean something other than CPU performance, GPU performance, and the amount of RAM. The increase in graphics performance over the past two decades has been astonishing, but there are other areas in which we can innovate and provide significant value to the game creators and through them, the players. That's why the SSD was very much on our list of directions to explore, regardless of what came out of the conversations with game developers and publishers. The biggest feature in this category is the custom engine for audio. That's today's final topic. The push for vastly improved audio, and in particular 3D audio, isn't something that came out of the developer meetings. It's much more the case that we had a dream of what might be possible five years from now, and then worked out a number of steps we could take to set us on that path. So here again are the three principles, the first being enabling the desires of developers to drive the hardware design. To me, the SSD really is the key to the next generation. It's a, a game changer. And it was the number one ask from developers for PlayStation 5. As in, we know it's probably impossible, but can you put an SSD in it? 
That was a discussion we were also having internally. It was clear that the presence of a hard drive in every PlayStation 4 was having a positive impact. A lot of things that would simply have been impossible at Blu-ray disc speeds were now possible. At the same time, though, in 2015 and 2016, when we were having these conversations, developers were already banging up against the limits of the hard drive, and a lot of developer time was being spent designing around slow load speeds. I want to focus in on just one number here, which is how long it takes to load a gigabyte of data from a hard drive. The difficulty being that hard drives are neither particularly fast nor flexible. If all your data is in one block, which is frankly not very likely, you can load 50 to 100 megabytes a second, depending on where the data is located on the hard drive. Let's assume it's on the outer edge, which means loading a gigabyte takes 10 seconds. If you compress your game packages, you can fit more data on the Blu-ray disc and also effectively boost your hard drive read speed by the compression ratio. We support Zlib decompression on PlayStation 4 that gets you something like 50% more data on the disk and 50% higher effective read speed. Unfortunately though, it's highly likely that your data is scattered around in various files on the hard drive, as well as sourced from multiple locations within those files. So lots of seeks are needed at 2 to 50-ish milliseconds each. My rule of thumb is that the hard drive is spending two-thirds of its time seeking and only a third of its time actually loading data. Putting all of that together, a gigabyte is very roughly 20 seconds to load from a hard drive. Now, a gigabyte is not much data. Games are using five or six gigabytes of RAM on PlayStation 4, so boot times and load times can get pretty grim. Or to put that differently, as a player, you wait for the game to boot, wait for the game to load, Wait for the level to reload every time you die, and you wait for what is euphemistically called fast travel. And all of that leads to the dream. What if we could have not just an SSD, but a blindingly fast SSD? If we could load five gigabytes a second from it, what would change? Now, SSDs are completely different from hard drives. They don't have seeks as such. If you have a five gigabyte a second SSD, you can read data from a thousand different locations in that second pretty much at speed. As for time to load a gigabyte, this is next gen we're talking about, so memory is bigger. Instead, we should be asking how long to load two gigabytes. And the answer is about a quarter of a second. I mean, that's amazing. We're talking two orders of magnitude, meaning very roughly 100 times faster. Which means at five gigabytes a second for the SSD, the potential is that the game boots in a second. There are no load screens. The game just fades down while loading a half dozen gigabytes and fades back up again. Same for a reload. You're immediately back in the action after you die. And fast travel becomes so fast it's blink and you miss it. As game creators, we go from trying to distract the player from how long fast travel is taking, like those Spider-Man subway rides, to being so blindingly fast that we might even have to slow that transition down. Pretty cool, right? But for me, this is not the primary reason to change from a hard drive to an SSD. The primary reason for an ultra-fast SSD is that it gives the game designer freedom. Or to put that differently, with a hard drive, the 20 seconds that it takes to load a gigabyte can sabotage the game that the developer is trying to create. I think almost all of us in the room have experienced this, maybe in different ways. Say we're making an adventure game and we have two rich environments where we each want enough textures and models to fill memory. Which you can do as long as you have a long staircase or elevator ride or a windy corridor where you can ditch the old assets and then take 30 seconds or so to load the new assets. Having a 30 second elevator ride is a, a little extreme. More realistically, we'd probably chop the world into a number of smaller pieces and then do some calculations with sight lines and run speeds like we did for Haven City when we were making Jack 2. The game is 20 years old, but not much has changed since then. All those twisty passages are there for a reason. There's a whole subset of level design dedicated to this sort of work, but still, it's a giant distraction for a team that just wants to make their game. So when I talked about the dream of an SSD, part of the reason for that five gigabyte a second target was to eliminate loads, but also part of the reason for that target was streaming. As in, what if the SSD is so fast that as the player is turning around, 
it's possible to load textures for everything behind the player in that split second. If you figure that it takes half a second to turn, that's four gigabytes of compressed data you can load. That sounds about right for next gen. Anyway, back to the hard drive. Another strategy for increasing effective read speed is to make big sequential chunks of data. For example, we might group all the data together for each city block. That removes most of the seeks, and the streaming gets faster. But there's a downside too, which is that frequently used data is included in many chunks and therefore is on the hard drive many, many times. Marvel's Spider-Man uses this strategy, and though it works very well for increasing the streaming speed, there's a massive duplication as a result. Some of the objects like mailboxes or news racks are on the hard drive 400 times. What I'm describing here are things that cramp a creative director's style. Either level design gets a little bit boring in places, or the data is duplicated so many times that it no longer fits on the Blu-ray disc. And you end up with hard limits on the player's run speed or driving speed. The player can't go faster than the load speed from the hard drive. And finally, I'm sure many of you have noticed that after a patch download, the PlayStation 4 will sometimes take a long time to install the patch. That's because when just part of a file has been changed, the new data can be downloaded pretty quickly. But before the game boots up, a brand new file has to be constructed that includes the changed portion. Otherwise, every change would add a seek or two. Even so, you can occasionally see this happening on game titles. They start to hitch once they get patched enough. With an SSD, though, no seeks, so no need to make brand new files with the changes incorporated into them, which means no installs as you know them today. There's yet one more benefit, which is that system memory can be used much more efficiently. On PlayStation 4, game data on the hard drive feels very distant and difficult to use. By the time you realize you need a piece of data, it's much too late to go out and load it. So system memory has to contain all of the data that can be used in the next 30 seconds or so of gameplay. That means a lot of the 8 gigabytes of system memory is idle. It's just waiting there to be potentially used. On PlayStation 5, though, the SSD is very close to being like more RAM. Typically, it's fast enough that when you realize you need a piece of data, you can just load it from the SSD and use it. There's no need to have lots of data parked in system memory waiting to potentially be used. A different way of saying that is that most of RAM is working on the game's behalf. This is one of the reasons that 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 feels right for PlayStation 5. The presence of the SSD reduces the need for a massive intergenerational increase. So back to the dream of the SSD. Here's the set of targets. Boot the game in a second. No load screens. Design freedom, meaning no twisty passages or long corridors. More game on the disc and more game on the SSD. And finally, those patch installs go away. The reality, though, is that the SSD is just one piece of the puzzle. There's a lot of places where bottlenecks can occur in between the SSD and the game code that uses the data. You can see this on PlayStation 4. If I use an SSD with 10 times the speed of a standard hard drive, I probably see only double the loading speed, if that. For PlayStation 5, our goal was not just that the SSD itself would be 100 times faster, it was that the game loads and streaming would be 100 times faster. So every single potential bottleneck needs to be addressed. And there are a lot of them. Let's look at check-in and what happens when its overhead gets 100 times. Conceptually, check-in is a pretty simple process. Data is loaded into system memory from the hard drive or SSD. It's examined, a few values are tweaked to check it in, and then it's moved to its final location. At the SSD speeds we're talking about, that last part, moving the data, meaning copying it from one location to another, takes roughly an entire next-gen CPU core. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. If all the overheads get 100 times larger, that will cripple the frame rate as soon as the player moves and that massive stream of data starts to come the SSD. So to solve all of that, we built a lot of custom hardware, namely a custom flash controller and a number of custom units in our image. The flash controller in the SSD was designed for smooth and bottleneck-free operation, but also with games in it. For example, there are six levels of priority in reading. Priority is very important. You can imagine the player heading into some new location in the world in the game requesting a, a few gigabytes of texture. And while those textures are being loaded, 
an enemy is shot and has to speak a few dying words. Having multiple priority levels lets the audio for those dying words get loaded immediately. On one side, that flash controller connects to the actual flash dies that supply the storage. To reach our bandwidth target of 5 gigabytes a second, we ended up with a 12-channel interface. Eight channels wouldn't be enough. The resulting bandwidth we've achieved is actually five and a half gigabytes a second. With a 12-channel interface, the most natural size that emerges for an SSD is 825 gigabytes. The key question for us was, is that enough? I mean, it's tempting to add more, but Flash certainly doesn't come cheap, and we have a responsibility to our gaming audience to be cost-effective with regards to what we put in the console. Ultimately, we resolved this question by looking at the play patterns of a broad range of gamers. We examined the specific games that they were playing over the course of a weekend or a week or a month, and whether that set of games would fit properly on the SSD. We were able to establish that the friction caused by reinstalls or redownloads would be quite low, and so we locked in on that 825 gigabyte size while also preparing multiple strategies so that those who want more storage can add. I'll go through the details in a moment. Back to the flash controller. On the other side, it connects to our main custom chip via four lanes of Gen 4 PCIe. And inside the main custom chip is a pretty hefty unit dedicated to I.O. Before we talk about what that does, let's talk compression for a moment. PlayStation 4 used Zlib as its compression format. We decided to use it again on PlayStation 5, but on my 2017 tour of developers, I learned about a new format called Kraken from Rad Game Tools. It's like Zlib's smarter cousin. Simple, uh, similar types of algorithms, but about 10% better compression, which is pretty big. That means 10% more game on the UHD Blu-ray disc or on the SSD. Kraken had only been out for a year, but it was already becoming a de facto industry standard. Half of the teams I talked to were either using it or getting ready to evaluate it. So we hustled and built a custom decompressor into the I.O. unit, one capable of handling over 5 gigabytes of Kraken format input data a second. After decompression, that typically becomes 8 or 9 gigabytes, but the unit itself is capable of outputting as much as 22 gigabytes a second if the data happen to compress particularly well. By the way, in terms of performance, that custom decompressor equates to nine of our Zen 2 cores. That's what it would take to decompress the Kraken stream with a conventional CPU. There's a lot more in the custom I.O. unit, including a dedicated DMA controller. The game can direct exactly where it wants to send the data coming off of the SSD. This equates to another Zen 2 core or two in terms of its copy performance. Its primary purpose is to remove check-in as a model. There's two dedicated I.O. coprocessors in a large RAM pool. These aren't Zen 2 cores. They are there principally to direct the variety of custom hardware around them. One of the coprocessors is dedicated to SSD I.O. This lets us bypass traditional file I.O. and its bottlenecks when reading from the SSD. The other is responsible for memory mapping, which I know doesn't sound like anything related to the SSD, but a lot of developers map and remap the memory as part of file I.O., and this too can become a bottleneck. There are coherency engines to assist the coprocessors. Coherency comes up a lot in places. Probably the biggest coherency issue is stale data in the GPU caches. Flushing all of the GPU caches whenever the SSD is read is an unattractive option. It could really hurt the GPU performance. So we've implemented a gentler way of doing things, where the coherency engines inform the GPU of the overwritten address ranges, and custom scrubbers in several dozen GPU caches do pinpoint evictions of just those address ranges. The best thing is, as a game developer, when you read from the SSD, you don't need to know any of this. You don't even need to know that your data is compressed. You just indicate what data you'd like to read from your original uncompressed file and where you'd like to put it, and the whole process of loading it happens invisibly to you and at very high speed. Back to the dream. Thanks to all of that surrounding hardware, our 5.5 gigabytes a second really should translate into something like 100 times faster I.O. than PS4 and allow the dream of no load screens and super fast streaming to become a reality. Having said that, expandability of our SSD is going to be quite important. Flash is costly, and you may very well want to add storage to whatever we put in the console. 
Now, the kind of storage you need depends on how you're going to use it. If you have an extensive PlayStation 4 library and you'd like to take advantage of backwards compatibility to play those games on PlayStation 5, then a large external hard drive is ideal. You can leave your games on the hard drive and play them directly from there, thus saving the pricier SSD storage for your PlayStation 5 titles, or you can copy your active PlayStation 4 titles to the SSD. If your purpose in adding more storage is to play PlayStation 5 titles, though, ideally you would add to your SSD storage. We will be supporting certain M2 SSDs. These are internal drives that you can get on the open market and install in a bay in the PlayStation 5. As for which ones we support and when, I'll get to that in a moment. They connect through the custom I.O. unit just like our SSD does, so they can take full advantage of the decompression, I.O. coprocessors, and all the other features I was talking about. Here's the catch, though. That commercial drive has to be at least as fast as ours. Games that rely on the speed of our SSD need to work flawlessly with any M2 drive. When I gave the Wired interview last year, I said that the PlayStation 5 SSD was faster than anything available on PC. At the time, commercial M2 drives used PCIe 3.0, and four lanes of that cap out at 3.5 gigabytes a second. In other words, no PCIe 3.0 drive can hit the required spec. M2 drives with PCIe 4.0 are now out in the market. We're getting our in uh, samples and seeing well, 4 or 5 gigabytes a second from them. By year's end, I expect there will be drives that saturate 4.0 and support 7 gigabytes a second. Having said that, we are comparing apples and oranges, though, because that commercial M2 drive will have its own architecture, its own flash controller, and so on. For example, the NVMe specification lays out a priority scheme for requests that the M2 drives can use. And that scheme is pretty nice, but it only has two true priority levels. Our drives support six. We can hook up a drive with only two priority levels, definitely, but our custom I.O. unit has to arbitrate the extra priorities, rather than the M2 drive's flash controller. And so the M2 drive needs a little extra speed to take care of issues arising from the different approach. That commercial drive also needs to physically fit inside of the bay we created in PlayStation 5 for M2 drives. Unlike internal hard drives, there's unfortunately no standard for the height of an M2 drive, and some M2 drives have giant heat sinks. In fact, some of them even have their own fans. Right now, we're getting M2 drive samples and benchmarking them in various ways. When games hit beta as they get ready for the PlayStation 5 launch at year end, we'll also be doing some compatibility testing to make sure that the architecture of particular M2 drives isn't too foreign for the games to handle. Once we've done that compatibility testing, we should be able to start letting you know which drives will physically fit and which drive samples have benchmarked appropriately high in our testing. It would be great if that happened by launch, but it's likely to be a, a bit past it. So please hold off on getting that M2 drive until you hear from us. Okay, back to our principles. Balancing evolution and revolution is the second of them. This was definitely a recurring theme with the GPU. We need new GPU features and capabilities. If, if we only have more performance, it's not really a new generation of console. Of course, many of these capabilities result in more performance. That's part of why a PlayStation 5 teraflop is more powerful than a PlayStation 4 teraflop. But we aren't just looking for the performance. We also need the ability to do something with the GPU that could not have been done before. And we need higher performance per watt. Every time we double the performance of some GPU component, we don't want to find out we've doubled the power consumed and the heat produced. But at the same time, we have to make sure the GPU can run PS4 games, and we have to ensure that the architecture is easy for the developers to adopt. Now, backwards compatibility was handled masterfully by AMD. They treated it as a key need throughout the design process. As our solution to adding new features without blindsiding developers, we made sure that if there were new significant features, it would be optional to use them. The GPU supports ray tracing, but you don't have to use ray tracing to make your game. The GPU supports primitive shaders, but you can release your first game on PlayStation 5 without making any use of it. Before I get into the capabilities of the GPU, I'd like to make clear two points that can be quite confusing. First, we have a custom AMD GPU based on their RDNA 2 technology. What does that mean? 
AMD is continuously improving and revising their tech. For RDNA 2, their goals were, roughly speaking, to reduce power consumption by re-architecting the GPU to put data close to where it's needed, to optimize the GPU for performance, and to add a new, more advanced feature set. But that feature set is malleable, which is to say that we have our own needs for PlayStation, and that can factor into what the AMD roadmap becomes. So collaboration is born. If we bring concepts to AMD that are felt to be widely useful, then they can be adopted into RDNA 2 and used broadly, including in PC GPUs. If the ideas are sufficiently specific to what we're trying to accomplish, like the GPU cache scrubbers I was talking about, then they end up being just for us. If you see a similar discrete GPU available as a PC card at roughly the same time as we release our console, that means our collaboration with AMD succeeded uh, in producing technology useful in both worlds. It doesn't mean that we as Sony simply incorporated the PC part into our console. This continuous improvement in AMD technology means it's dangerous to rely on teraflops as an absolute indicator of performance, and CU count should be avoided as well. In the case of CPUs, we all understand this. The PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 each have eight CPUs, but we never think that meant the capabilities and performance are equal. It's the same for CUs. For one thing, they've been getting much larger over time. Adding new features means adding lots of transistors. In fact, uh, the transistor count for a PlayStation 5 CU is 62% larger than the transistor count for a PlayStation 4 CU. Second, the PlayStation 5 GPU is backwards compatible with PlayStation 4. What does that mean? One way you can achieve backwards compatibility is to put the previous console's chipset in the new console, like we did with some PlayStation 3s. But that's, of course, extremely expensive. A better way is to incorporate any differences in the previous console's logic into the new console's custom chips. Meaning that even as the technology evolves, the logic and feature set that PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 4 Pro titles rely on is still available in backwards compatibility modes. One advantage of this strategy is that once backwards compatibility is in the console, it's in. It's not as if a cost down will remove backwards compatibility like it did on PlayStation 3. Achieving this unification of functionality took years of efforts by AMD, as any roadmap advancement creates a potential divergence in logic. Running PS4 and PS4 titles at boosted frequencies has also added complexity. The boost is truly massive this time around, and some game code just can't handle it. Testing has to be done on a title-by-title -title basis. Results are excellent. We recently took a look at the top 100 PlayStation 4 titles as ranked by Playtime, and we're expecting almost all of them to be playable at launch on PlayStation 4. With regards to new features, as I said, our strategy was to try to break new ground, but at the same time not to require use of the new GPU capabilities. For more than a decade, GPUs have imposed a restriction on game engines. Software handles vertex processing, but for the most part, dedicated hardware is responsible for the triangles and other geometry that the vertices form. That means it's not possible to do even basic optimizations, such as aborting processing of a vertex if all geometry that uses it is off screen. PlayStation 5 has a, a new unit called the Geometry Engine, which brings handling of triangles and other primitives under full programmatic control. As a game developer, you're free to ignore its existence and use the PlayStation 5 GPU as if it were no more capable than the PS4 GPU, or you can use this new intelligence in various ways. Simple usage could be performance optimizations, such as removing backspaced or off-screen vertices and triangles. More complex usage involves something called primitive shaders, which allow the game to synthesize geometry on the fly as it's being rendered. It's a brand new capability. Using primitive shaders on PlayStation 5 will allow for a, a broad variety of techniques, including smoothly varying level of detail, addition of procedural detail to close-up objects, and improvements to particle effects and other visual special effects. Another major new feature of our custom RDNA 2-based GPU is ray tracing, using the same strategy as AMD's upcoming PC GPUs. The CUs contain a new specialized unit called the Intersection Engine, which can calculate the intersection of rays with boxes and triangles. To use the intersection engine, first you build what is called an acceleration structure. 
It's data in RAM that contains all of your VR. There's a specific set of formats you can use. They're variations on the same BDH concept. Then, in your shader program, you use a new instruction that asks the intersection engine to check array against the BDH. While the intersection engine is processing the requested ray triangle or ray box intersection, the shaders are free to do otherwise. Having said that, the ray tracing instruction is pretty memory intensive, so it's a good mix with logic heavy code. There's of course no need to use ray tracing. PS4 graphics engines will run just fine on PlayStation 5, but it presents an opportunity for those interested. I'm thinking it'll take less than a million rays a second to have a big impact on audio. That should be enough for audio occlusion and some reverb calculations. With a bit more of the GPU invested in ray tracing, it should be possible to do some very nice global illumination. Having said that, adding ray trace shadows and reflections to a traditional graphics engine could easily take hundreds of millions of rays a second, and full ray tracing could take billions. How far can we go? I'm starting to get quite bullish. I've already seen a PlayStation 5 title that's successfully using ray tracing based reflections in complex animated scenes with only modest. Another set of issues for the GPU involve size and frequency. How big do we make the GPU, and what frequency do we run at? This is a balancing act. The chip has a cost, and there's a cost for whatever we use to supply that chip with power and to cool it. In general, I like running the GPU at higher frequency. Let me show you why. Here's two possible configurations for a GPU roughly of the level of the PlayStation 4 Pro. This is a thought experiment. Don't take these configurations too seriously. If you just calculate teraflops, you get the same number. But actually, the performance is noticeably different because teraflops is defined as the computational capability of the vector ALU. That's just one part of the GPU. There are a lot of other units. And those other units all run faster when the GPU frequency is higher. At 33% higher frequency, rasterization goes 33% faster. Processing the command buffer goes that much faster. The L2 and uh, other caches have that much higher bandwidth, and so on. About the only downside is that system memory is 33% further away in terms of cycles. But the large number of benefits more than counterbalance that. As a friend of mine says, a rising tide lifts all boats. Also, it's easier to fully use 36 CUs in parallel than it is to fully use 48 CUs. When triangles are small, it's much harder to fill all those CUs with useful work. So there's a lot to be said for faster, assuming you can handle the resulting power and heat issues, which frankly, we haven't always done the best job at. Part of the reason for that is, historically, our process for setting CPU and GPU frequencies has relied on some heavy-duty guesswork with regards to how much electrical power games will consume and how much heat will be produced as a result inside of the console. Power consumption varies a lot from game to game. When I play God of War on my PS4 Pro, I know the power consumption is high just by the fan noise. But power isn't simply about engine quality. It's about the minutia of what's being displayed and how. It's counterintuitive, but processing dense geometry typically consumes less power than processing simple geometry, which is, I suspect, why Horizon's map screen, with its low triangle count, makes my PS4 Pro heat up so much. Our process on previous consoles has been to try to guess what the maximum power consumption during the entire console lifetime might be, which is to say, the worst case scene in the worst case game, and prepare cooling solution that we think will be quiet at that power level. If we get it right, fan noise is minimal. If we get it wrong, the console will be quite loud for the higher power games, and there's even a chance that it might overheat and shut down if we misestimate power too badly. PlayStation 5 is especially challenging because the CPU supports 256-bit native instructions that consume a lot of power. These are great here and there, but presumably only minimally used. Or are they? If we plan for major 256-bit instruction usage, we need to set the CPU clock substantially lower or noticeably increase the size of the power supply and fan. So, after much discussion, we decided to go with a very different direction on PlayStation 5. 
we built a GPU with 36 CUs. Mind you, our DNA2 CUs are large. Each has 62% more transistors than the CUs we were using on PlayStation 4. So if we compare transistor counts, 36 RDNA2 CUs equates to roughly 58 PlayStation 4 CUs. It is a fairly sizable GPU. Then we went with a variable frequency strategy for PlayStation 5, which is to say we continuously run the GPU and CPU in boost mode. We supply a generous amount of electrical power and then increase the frequency of GPU and CPU until they reach the capabilities of the system's cooling solution. It's a completely different paradigm. Rather than running at constant frequency and letting power vary based on the workload, we run at essentially constant power and let the frequency ba vary based on the workload. We then tackled the engineering challenge of a cost-effective and high-performance cooling solution designed for that specific power level. In some ways, it becomes a simpler problem because there are no more unknowns. There's no need to guess what power consumption the worst-case game might have. As for the details of the cooling solution, we're saving them for our teardown. I think you'll be quite happy with what the engineering team came up with. So how fast can we run the GPU and CPU with this strategy? The simplest approach would be to look at the actual temperature of the silicon die and throttle the frequency on that basis. But that won't work. It fails to create a consistent PlayStation 5 experience. It wouldn't do to run a console slower simply because it was in a hot room. So rather than look at the actual temperature of the silicon die, we look at the activities that the GPU and CPU are performing and set the frequencies on that basis, which makes everything deterministic and repeatable. While we're at it, we also use AMD's Smart Shift technology and send any unused power from the CPU to the GPU so it can squeeze out a few more pixels. Benefits in this, this strategy are quite large. Running a GPU at 2 GHz was looking like an unreachable target with the old fixed frequency strategy. With this new paradigm, we're, we're able to run way over that. In fact, we have to cap the GPU frequency at 2.23 GHz so that we can guarantee that the on-chip logic operates properly. 36 CUs at 2.23 GHz is 10.3 teraflops, and we expect the GPU to spend most of its time at or close to that frequency and performance. Similarly, running the CPU at 3 GHz was causing headaches with the old strategy. But now we can run it as high as 3.5 GHz. In fact, it spends most of its time at that frequency. That doesn't mean all games will be running at 2.23 GHz and 3.5 GHz. When that worst case game arrives, it will run at a lower clock speed, but not too much lower. To reduce power by 10%, it only takes a couple of percent reduction in frequency, so I'd expect any downclocking to be pretty minor. All things considered, the change to a variable frequency approach will show significant gains for PlayStation gamers. The final of our three principles was about finding new dreams. It's important for us on the hardware team to find new ways to expand or deepen gaming, and that's what led us to a focus on 3D audio. As players, we experience the game through the visuals, through audio, and through the feedback we receive from the controller, such as rumble or haptics. Personally, I feel a game is just dead without audio. Visuals are, of course, important, but the impact of audio is huge as well. At the same time, the audio team on a game project has to do a lot with a little. For example, on PlayStation 4, there's fierce competition for the Jaguar CPU cores. Audio typically ends up getting just a fraction of a core. That's not much of a computational resource, particularly when you consider that the visuals run at 30 or 60 frames a second, but audio processing needs to happen at almost 200 times a second. So it's been tough going making forward progress on audio with PlayStation 4, particularly when PlayStation 3 was such a beast when it came to audio. The SPUs in Cell were almost a perfect device for audio rendering. Simple pipelined algorithms could really take advantage of asynchronous DMA and frequently reached 100% utilization of the floating point unit. There's unfortunately nothing comparable on PlayStation 4. Probably the most dramatic progress in the PlayStation 4 generation has been with virtual reality. The PSVR hardware has its own audio unit. It supports about 50 pretty decent 3D sound sources. And this provided a hint as to where we could go with audio, as well as some valuable experience. 
Not to oversimplify, but here were our goals for audio on PlayStation 5. The first goal was great audio for everyone, not just VR users or soundbar owners or headphone users. That meant audio had to be part of the console. It couldn't be a peripheral. The second goal was to support hundreds of sound sources. We didn't want developers to have to pick and choose what sounds would get 3D effects and which wouldn't. We wanted every sound in the game to have dimensionality. And finally, we wanted to really take on the challenges of presence and locality. Now, when we say presence, we mean the feeling that you're actually there. You've entered the matrix. It's not, of course, something we thought we could perfectly achieve, but the idea was that if we stopped using just a rain sound and instead used lots of 3D audio sources for raindrops hitting the ground at all sorts of locations around you, then at some point your brain would take a leap and you'd begin to have this feeling, this feeling of real presence inside the virtual world of the game. This has the capacity to affect your appreciation of the game, just like music in a game does. The concept of locality is simpler. It's just your sense of where the audio is coming from, to the right of you, behind you, above you. This can immerse you further in the game, and it can also directly enhance the gameplay. To use Dead Space as an example, I know, old school, you're fighting enemies in fairly dark, spooky locations. Back in the day, if you played the game using the TV speakers, you could tell that there was one last enemy growling and hunting you down, but it was difficult to tell quite where that enemy was. With headphones, you could tell that the enemy was somewhere on the right, which let you deduce, if you couldn't see it, that it must be somewhere behind and to your right. But with 3D audio with good locality, the idea is you know the enemy is precisely there, and you turn, and you take it out. So, how do we know where a sound is coming from in the first place? Well, all those bumps and folds in the ear have a meaning, evolutionarily speaking. Based on what direction the sound is coming from, sound waves bounce around inside the ear, there's some constructive and destructive interference, and the result is a change in volume. The phase of the sound also shifts, depending on what path the sound wave took to reach the ear canal. These volume changes and phase shifts are different for each direction and also vary depending on the frequency of the sound. Head size and head shape also impact the sound in a similar fashion. The way that the sound changes based on direction and frequency can be encoded in a table called the Head Related Transfer Function, or HRTF. Here's part of it. The vertical axis is the frequency, the horizontal axis is the direction, front, back, left, right, and the color gives the degree of attenuation of the sound at that frequency. The HRTF is as unique to an individual as a fingerprint is. In fact, you're looking at mine right now. Here's how we measure an HRTF. We've taken hundreds of people through this process. We put a microphone in the subject's left and right ear canals, and then sit the subject down in the middle of an array of 22 speakers. We then play an audio sweep from each speaker as we rotate the subject. In the course of 10 or 20 minutes, we're able to sample the HRTF at over 1,000 locations. Using an HRTF when rendering audio creates unparalleled quality, but it's computationally expensive. The simplest way to use an HRTF is to process a sound source to make it appear as if it's coming from one of those 1,000 locations we sample. Unfortunately, the processing has to be done in frequency domain rather than time domain, so there's multiple fast Fourier transforms needed for every sound source for every audio tick. That's a lot of multiplies. This computational complexity was the determining factor for our strategy. It meant we had to bite the bullet and design and build a custom hardware unit for 3D audio. Collectively, we're referring to the hardware unit and the proprietary algorithms we run on it as Tempest 3D Audio Tech. The meaning of 3D audio and technology should be pretty obvious here. As for Tempest, I feel it really reflects our goals with audio. It suggests a certain intensity of experience and also hints at your presence within it. We're calling the hardware unit that we built the Tempest engine. It's based on AMD's GPU technology. We modified a compute unit in such a way as to make it very close to the SPUs in PlayStation 3. Remember when I said that they were ideal for audio? So the Tempest engine has no caches, just like an SPU. All data access is via DMA, just like an SPU. 
Our target was that it would have more power than a CPU, thanks to the parallelism that a GPU can achieve, and that it would be more efficient than our GPU, thanks to the SPU-like architecture. The goal being to make possible near 100% utilization of the CU's vector units. Where we ended up is a unit with roughly the same SIMD power and bandwidth as all eight Jaguar cores in the PlayStation 4 combined. If we were to use the same algorithms as PSVR, that's enough for something like 5,000 sound sources. But of course, we want to use more complex algorithms, and we don't need anything like that number of sounds. It would have been wonderful if a simpler strategy, such as using Dolby Atmos peripherals, could have achieved our goals, but we wanted 3D audio for all, not just those with licensed soundbars or the like. Also, we wanted many hundreds of sound sources, not just the 32 that Atmos supports. And finally, we wanted to be able to throw an overwhelming amount of processing power at the problem, and it wasn't clear what any peripheral might have inside of it. In fact, with the Tempest extension, we've even got enough power that we can allocate some to the games, to the extent that games want to make use of convolution reverb and other algorithms that are either computationally expensive or need high bandwidth. But the primary purpose of the Tempest engine remains 3D audio. Now, 3D audio is a major academic research topic. It's safe to say that no one in the world has all of the answers. And the set of algorithms that has to be invented, tuned, or implemented to realize our vision for 3D audio is immense. For example, use of HRTFs in games is quite complex. Before, I talked about making a sound source appear as if it's coming uh, from one of those thousand HRTF sample locations. But for high quality 3D game audio, we have to handle other possibilities. The sound source might not be at one of the thousand HRTF sample locations, so we have to blend the HRTF data from the closest locations that we have sampled. The sound source might be moving, which needs very special handling as that blend keeps changing, and that can cause phase artifacts in the resulting audio. Or the sound source might have a size to it, meaning it should feel as if it's coming from an area rather than a single point. There's also whole categories of approaches to be handled. 3D audio can be implemented using individual processing of 3D sound sources. But alternatively, ambisonics can be used for 3D audio, ambisonics being somewhat like the spherical harmonics used in computer graphics. And finally, there's audio devices. The player might be using headphones or TV speakers or have a higher-end surround sound set up with six or more speakers, all of which need different approaches. That's a lot of variations. It's nice to have the computational resources of the Tempest engine, but it's clear that achieving our ultimate goals with 3D audio is going to be a multi-year, step-by-step process. Having said that, headphone audio implementation is largely complete at this time. Uh, it was a natural place for us to start. With headphones, we control exactly what each ear hears, and therefore the algorithmic development and implementation are more straightforward. For TV speakers and stereo speakers, we're in the process of implementing virtual surround sound. The idea being that if you're sitting in a sweet spot in front of the TV, then the sound can be made to feel as if it's coming from any direction, even behind you. Virtual surround sound has a lot in common with 3D audio on headphones, but it's more complex because the left ear can hear the right speaker and vice versa. We have a basic implementation of virtual surround sound up and running. We're now looking at increasing the size of that sweet spot, which is to say, making the area you need to be in to feel the 3D effect larger. And we're also working to boost the sense of locality. Headphone audio is the current gold standard for 3D audio on PlayStation 5, but we're going to see what we can do to bring virtual surround sound to a similar level, after which we'll start in on setups with more speakers, such as six-channel surround sound. It's now to the point where some of the PlayStation 5 games in development are extensively using these systems. One of the game demos allows you to toggle between conventional PlayStation 4-style stereo audio and our new 3D audio. I listened with just an ordinary pair of over-the-ear headphones, and wow, I could feel a difference. 3D audio has that dimensional feel to it. Conventional stereo audio feels smashed flat by comparison. The improvement is obvious. So, a big advancement, but have I entered the matrix? Does my brain believe I'm really there? Like I was talking about earlier when I explained our target of present. Well, the answer is no. 
but you've probably caught on to what's missing here, namely whose HRTF was being used. It wasn't mine, it was the default HRTF. The audio team analyzed the hundreds that they measured and chose the one they felt was the closest fit to the total game playing audience. This shows a, a piece of the default HRTF on the left and my HRTF on the right. You can see that the general features are much the same, but the details are quite different. With the default HRTF, as I said, the 3D audio sounds pretty great. When I use my HRTF, though, the audio reaches a, a higher level of realism, which is to say that when using headphones and my HRTF, I occasionally get fooled and even think a sound is coming from the real world when it's actually coming from the game. A corollary to this is that there are a few people whose HRTFs are sufficiently far from the default HRTF, that's the red dot here, that they can toggle between PS4 style and PS5 style audio and not sense much difference. I've had a few people describe the PlayStation 5's 3D audio as sounding like a bit better stereo audio. Presumably they're the ones at the very edges of this diagram. Which means what HRTF you're using is key. I'd like everyone to be able to experience what I'm experiencing, but obviously it's not possible to measure the HRTF of every PlayStation user. That means HRTF selection and synthesis are going to be big topics going forward as the Tempest technology matures. At PlayStation 5 launch, we'll be offering a choice of five HRTFs. There's a, a simple test where you pick the one that gives you the best locality. That's just the first step, though. This is an open-ended research topic. Maybe you'll be sending us a photo of your ear, and we'll choose a neural network to pick the closest HRTF in our library. Maybe you'll be sending us a video of your ears and your head, and we'll make a 3D model of them and synthesize the HRTF. Maybe you'll play an audio game to tune your HRTF. We'll be subtly changing it as you play and home in on the HRTF that gives you the highest score, meaning that it matches you the best. This is a journey we'll all be taking together over the next few years. Ultimately, we're committing to enabling everyone to experience that next level of realism. Hopefully, I've been able to illustrate a bit about our design and decision-making process today and why PlayStation 5 has the feature set that it does. Now comes the fun part. We get to see how the development community takes advantage of that feature set. I'm hoping for the completely unexpected. Will it come from audio, ray tracing, the capabilities of the SSD, or something else? I guess we'll find out soon enough. Thank you for your time.